Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Nuggets News. Today we've got a very special guest and that's Carter from Coin Mastery. How are you going, mate? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty well and I'm a big fan of yours and everyone was saying, check out Carter and Coin Mastery. He's you know, level-headed, doesn't shield coins and all that sort of stuff. So I love your work and today we're going to talk about your background and startups and cycles and what's going on in the space in general, I guess. So for anyone that hasn't followed your work, What's your background and how did you get into crypto? Well, uh, the, the very long story short is that I worked at a startup right at the perfect timing for the global financial crisis. So I got to watch it firsthand, uh, very small startup in a very small town in a very poor state in, in the United States, up in a place called Maine. And uh, you know, I had these big dreams with sold on the stock options, the whole deal and just watched the, the floor fall out from underneath the economy. Now, it was interesting because I didn't have any money. So I didn't really, like it didn't really register to me. I was kind of like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, 600 points today, like, oops. But you know, I didn't have a retirement account or anything. So, but when I started to see everyone get fired, that's when I realized, hey, this is, this is a, what this is like, has serious implications. And between that, uh, and realizing that a lot of what was being sold to me, both from the mass media, from my own bosses, from like the college I went to, was was not really going to turn out the way I thought it was. This was kind of like if I didn't take control of this, this was going to be a problem in a lot of ways. And so I left that job and started my own thing. Problem was uh, in a small town in a very poor state, there's not a lot of people that uh, want to hire some young kid with no experience and no real idea what he's doing. And uh, I managed to figure out how to start selling websites to uh, local businesses. And that led me into um, starting some projects on the side. Like I've always kind of had my eye on things on the side. I started building uh, iPhone apps or hiring people to build them built a couple thousand, hired teams to build these apps and it got really, really big, started a website that taught people how to do this. And then that brought me out here to San Francisco where I really immersed myself into the whole tech thing. It was really starting to take off. This was 2012 and I was starting to see, you know, Uber people were realizing, hey, this is, this is, might be a real company. And Facebook was really starting to take off with advertising. And uh, it was really exciting, really, t- really exciting time to be here. And uh, in 2016, I was looking around and being like, all right, this app thing was, it was good, but I was spending a lot of my time trying to convince people that they should do it. You know, instead of it being, I want to build an app, it was, you know, tell me why I should, I, I should build an app. And it's a, there's, if there's nothing, uh, one of the best pieces of advice I ever got is if you ever want to ruin your life, spend spend your time trying to convince people to do things or try to change other people or, you know, <laughs> some yeah. phrase of that. And uh, so I started searching around and I had been buying Bitcoin kind of loosely because Coinbase is right down the street here. And I figured, you know, why not? And uh, met some of those guys. And then I, I started meeting with people around town looking for like, what's the next thing? What, what's going to keep going big? And I was looking at Amazon businesses. So I started an Amazon business, do, you know, website, ClickBank, stuff like that. And uh, I kept coming back to crypto. And everyone was like, dude, crypto is not going to, this isn't going to be a thing. It's like some bunch of hackers. And I ended up helping a guy who had a, Sado, a Satoshi Dice site uh, with his marketing. Yeah. And that was the, okay, you know, this is, there's something to this. And I uh, started buying more Bitcoin, started buying a lot of Ethereum. And then 2017 hit, and all of a sudden, I found myself in Facebook groups. I found myself on Telegram, and um, it was really, really exciting. The problem was no one was really talking about the stuff I was interested in. I wasn't necessarily interested in uh, getting too deep into the tech. I wasn't too interested in um, like the technical analysis of the charts. I was interested in what, what's, the big, what's this all mean? Why, why is this all happening? And I'm like, where's this going? And so, um, you know, I turned on a webcam, started talking to a microphone and said, listen, I don't know what's going to happen here. I don't know much about trading or markets, but I want to find out and I'm going to document this journey. 
And that was about a year ago, and, and here we are. And that's the idea of Coin Mastery. Yeah, fantastic. That's it. It's so funny that um, a few of our followers, um, the followers both were saying, get Carter on, there's so much synergy there. And just from what you said there, I had no interest in money and stocks until the GFC when my parents gave me some shares for my 21st birthday in 2008. And... Then I said to dad, you know, do we have to pay our manager to lose half our money? And he's like, yeah. And I was just like, wow, I need to learn about how this world works. And went down the rabbit hole, watched all those documentaries and I found, um, do you know the Tasty Trade guys that talk a lot about options and all that sort of thing? The US? Uh, yeah, I, I've seen a few videos of theirs, yeah. Yeah, so I just, oh, I watched every video of theirs and I was like, I can't believe this is how the world of finance and central banking and debt works and they make it out to sound so hard. But it's pretty easy to understand once you get your head around all these concepts. So very interesting. And that's what convinced me that Bitcoin was always going to work. And then, as you say, no one was interested until Ethereum came along and, you know, changed things up a little bit. And you've seen it firsthand there in San Francisco, I guess. So what happened last year from your side of the fence? Because I know in Australia, it was, you know, speculation, a lot of it. Whereas where you are, there's actually, you know, the guys building behind the scenes, what did you see in terms of hype, overinvestment? Where's that cycle going now? Well, on a local level, right? So in San Francisco, um, what you tend to see is, in my opinion, there's a lot of people uh, last year that were, they're, they're, you know, they're putting on a really, they're wrapping up greed in a really pretty wrapper. Yeah. Uh, you know, if, if that makes sense, where, you know, lots of high level discussions, lots of complex things and blah, blah, blah. But I could I could slice a knife through that conversation just like that when I said, hey, I know it's going to pump next week. All of a sudden, like nobody cared about all the stuff they were talking about five minutes ago. And, you know, it was just kind of hilarious that like, just be honest with what, what you guys are doing here. Like, why are you really trying to put on this front? Um, now that being said, I did meet a lot of people that were legit, uh, very engineer focused hacker developer types who were building some really amazing stuff. Like some of the guys, uh, you know, on the zero X side of that whole world. And, um, a lot of people in the Ethereum kind of cult around Coinbase and crypto castle, that whole world is definitely true believers in it but you know when you become when you make 50 million 100 million bucks uh and you're under the age of 30 under the age of 25 sometimes like it's very difficult to navigate that when you become this these these you know gods these celebrities and so the, it, it was kind of this weird world of uh, popularity of money of trying to uh steer a course of, of a new direction of, of the paradigm or whatever with all of these people that wanted to get in for for really the same reason. Like they wanted to be a piece of that movement and they also wanted a big piece of that money. Yeah, even some of the investing groups that started off doing fundamentals and white paper reading, they actually changed their narrative to what is going to pump when it lists. Like this thing has a sexy website name and coming from Korea, like this is going to pump. And that's when you knew that everything was out the window and this was just getting crazy, I think. That's mm. right. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that it's, you know, I, I mean, as, as someone who has a, a, a background in health and, and wellness and everything else, I mean, I always just drill down to the, what's the common denominator, especially as a marketer. I mean, this is what you learn as a marketer. And dopamine is just, you, you can't sustain dopamine by talking about the same thing every single day. And as much as I wish I could do daily videos talking about, hey, you know, the price isn't moving that much or coming up with exciting content about fundamentals and whatever else it may be, it just doesn't release dopamine in viewership. And uh, that is a, an analogy that you can apply to the entire crypto space. And there's, there's not a whole lot you can do about that except talking about the exciting pump-related dopamine-driving things. And if you want to keep that those levels high and the price action isn't doing what you want, you need to manufacture that dopamine. You need to do it through artificial excitement. And, you know, it, it, it comes, I've seen it in 15 different industries. I, I've, you know, 
the same stuff you see everywhere is just like you it, it kind of makes you realize okay well this there's only so much of this that you can really do um until you got to wait for the the cycle to to kind of reset and, and move back up oh man we, i could unpack that so much that whole dopamine statement it is it is exactly what happens and during the bear cycles when there is no excitement and no dopamine and the few people that are left watching the youtube videos they're probably the ones that are going to benefit and then when we have this next run in the future it's the people that have been there during the tough times and learned what's good and what's bad as you say zero x and so on that we get this next wave of people that are going through the dopamine cycle for the first time and that's what people have seen now in crypto and it continues and i think we've got one or two more big cycles left i don't think we've gone through that dot-com bubble where there's just you know this is there's nothing left in the future i think there's way too much happening behind the scenes for this all to turn out to be nothing but i mm-hmm. think people are going to come back to bitcoin in a lot of ways and people as you say that ethereum community is very strong do you think there's just too much of the the next big thing that want to get rich oh, i've missed i've missed out on bitcoin i've missed out on ethereum i need to find the next thing and we might find that the Bitcoin dominance, if they get scaling and Lightning Network and if Ethereum takes off, they do get the majority of dApps and so on? Or are you being pretty open-minded to what may happen? Uh, my When it comes to the next big boom as it relates to price action, I, I think that whenever, you know, the bubbles really come down to being able to justify valuations that have no business being valued at what they are because there's no there's no way to compare it, right? So when you look at every bubble, it's really because some new thing came and the people disagree on what the future looks like for that particular thing. And there's no way to compare it to what currently is because it's too new. And that's, that's what drives all bubbles, speculative bubbles, I should say. And I think that uh, crypto... Is definitely has that potential, but it needs a new narrative. It needs a new story to tell. Because if we try to take the same exchanges with the same tokens and f- go up to 60,000 instead of 19,000, CNBC and everybody who's in the current market is going to look at this and be like, it's the same thing. I've seen it before. There's nothing new here. Right. And this past. 2017, 2018 cycle, there was so much new. There was all these new exchanges. There was all these new people. There's all this new exposure. Uh, If we want it to happen again, which I think it will happen again, it needs a new framework. And what I think that framework will be is how it integrates into profitable companies or how blockchain companies become profitable or have like use cases that can uh, be used in a way that is related to money. And so all of a sudden you start seeing companies and instead of companies like Square or Overstock that are like using Bitcoin or putting Bitcoin in their name or transacting Bitcoin, they're actually implementing some of these technologies and showing on their SEC filing reports that they're becoming more profitable. And all of a sudden the story becomes, well, it's not just a token, it's the technology. And these companies get a 40% premium when you implement this blockchain technology. Like, look at the numbers, like this is insane. And that's kind of what happened with the internet where people could just say, oh, just you, you, have, you have a retail store, put it online. You're gonna get a hundred times the users and it's gonna be half as much cost to operate and you can just ship it out your front door and that's, all of a sudden your business triples. It's kind of and what that, we saw in Japan as well last year that really ignited things when those countries that accepted right. Bitcoin start to see an increase in business, as you say. Yeah, That's right, yeah. That, and I think that, so it's, it, it'll be a lot of the same stuff. It'll be a lot of the same technologies, potentially the same way the tokens are done. Might see things like security tokens uh, integrate their way into there, but it'll all be the same type of deal. But it has to be a new story. Yeah, there has to be a new, a new valuation metric, that all of a sudden, the people that are skeptical now at the top are like, "Huh, I can't really argue with that." I could argue with a token that had no, that was just an idea, yeah. but I can't argue with money. I can't argue with profits. Yeah. So I think that that gets, 
we start seeing that, you're going to start to see a lot of a lot of things start to happen. I completely agree. Like, if we're going to have another alt season, alt run that everyone loves, it can't be the narrative last time of white papers and ideas. And and you know, people aren't just going to pump more money in through Binance. And I completely agree that it has to be right. That one has got a working project. They've launched their app. There's real demand for that token, and that can spur more future speculation. Even if the actual use case and you know users and all that is coming off a low base, at least they've got a new story. So yeah, yeah, and I think a, a, a great uh, like test, I guess, is when you go on whatever wherever people are hanging out, right? Maybe they're on Reddit or Telegram or Twitter or wherever their their uh, their community is. Right now. Anytime, like even, I mean, even today, like you, you see price action move up, you see an overwhelming number of people that are like, oh, this is exciting. Here's where I'm taking my profits. I don't want, you know, I've been down this road before, right? For, for good reason, whatever. At some point, there's going to be a new story that causes people to say, you know what? I'm going to let this ride because insert reason. Yes. And when, when you start hearing people say that, that's when you know and I think, it, it's on. I think that will reflect in the charts. We won't have that you yeah. know, parabolic. We'll have people that are getting out at break even, so it's going to be a you know, less steep curve. And then, as you say, we saw it last year when people got burnt when they bought Ethereum at 400 and it fell back to 100, and then they got out at 400, and then they're back in once it's at 600 chasing it again. So it's all human psychology. But the next thing I wanted to ask you about was the macro side of things. And I remember someone once saying that, you know, money wants to find a home and money will flow to where it's treated best. And there's been so much money printed trying to, you know, spur economic growth or however you want to break that down. Um, a low yield world. Where, where do you think this all sort of ties in? Um, well, I think you know it, it's really hard to know um, how this is going to play out in that sense because crypto, specifically Bitcoin, it, it's just so small, right? You know, you talk to whether it be a hedge fund manager or a, a you know professional trading desk or, or any anyone who's got money, like they got a, they're moving a lot of of money. And, I mean, it's like. Okay, let's do a fifty, hundred million dollar trade or something like that. You can't, you just can't do that in the cryptocurrency world right now. I mean, you can mess around with Bitcoin, Bitcoin futures, things like that, but you know, it's very difficult. And so, I think that uh, we don't really know quite yet. But eventually, um, one thing that came out of the global financial crisis, for better or for worse, is that it, it really solidified this idea that. The finance finance industry uh, will never stop creating new ways to create things that people can buy and own. Synthetic products will that is the name of the game. It started in 1982 and it's going to keep going f for probably for the next 50, 100 years. And I think that cryptocurrency adds. Uh, a very, very compelling way to create new products. Now, that could be an ETF or it could be like a collateralized loan that's using blockchain or using crypto assets or maybe it's a way to securitize artwork and collectibles and whatever else it may be. But I have no doubt in my mind that at some point, uh, as the world becomes this passive income-driven index fund where everybody's getting 4%, the banks are going to come out and say, you know, we need to create some things that we can sell that are getting 8% or 10%. And if we, even if we got to make this stuff up, we're going to make it up. And I think crypto and that tokenization process offers that. Um, how that plays out, I'm not sure. I think Bitcoin's probably going to be the, the best first test of it, uh, purely as an asset, like a traded asset that gets liquid enough where it, it resolves itself on a price, uh, especially as you see all these CFTC reports and, you know, the exchange integrity and all that sort of thing. Um, but I think then you'll see just assets, yeah, be tokenized and then be traded on an exchange somewhere and have a liquidity premium to them. And that becomes an asset class. Because then you can take, you can literally take anything you want 
wrap it into a product and sell that product as an ETF, as a mutual fund. I mean, as a default. So, I mean, you could, you could trade whatever you want. Like, oh, I'm doing a, a car, a, a, a vintage car a security product. And it's easy to do because it's all tokenized. And so you can measure it, trade it, have the price, market value, everything. Don't joke about um, that. There's an ICO in Australia called BitCar that are tokenizing <laughs> collectible cars. And the sales pitch well, there you go. The sales pitch is that collectible cars have actually outperformed stock markets during turndowns and they sort of hold their value, the rare Porsches and stuff. So they're tokenizing that. So crazy. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, like but those ideas, um, you know, I, I think as the, as the industry, as the technology and as the regulation, as it all works itself out, like it sounds crazy. Uh, I mean, it doesn't sound crazy. It's just kind of like, it, it's kind of uh, not in, or inefficient or kind of out there, I guess. But I think in 10 years, it'll be, it, it'll make complete sense that you can put a value on anything and package it up into any fit, like asset you want, and that has a market value that gets a certain return every year. It gets a certain yield every year, uh, and what and certain companies do this really well, and like that's where kind of the the new returns come from. That's that's some of the sales pitches we're seeing in Australia. Resource rich country, heaps of land, real estate, in ground minerals. People are t- working out right how do we tokenize that and make it more liquid. I guess so. It's going to be right. interesting to watch all that play out. Any final thoughts, mate, about where we are at the moment and you know how what you see behind the scenes um, in San Francisco compared to what we see here in Australia. I think the I think the um, you know there's there's a great uh, a great blog post I read recently uh, about kind of the the two stories of of crypto it's like Bitcoin basically and Ethereum and the finance versus tech not versus but you know it, that's kind of the two paths that's gone down and I think that's what you're going to see is this is a divergence of the finance world who just wants tradable assets that they can they can make money off of and then you see the tech which builds new technologies uh, as it relates to whether it be t- asset generation whether it be uh, efficiency whatever and you're gonna see those split and you're gonna see a very clear divide in the crypto community on which way they go which which parts of that excite them uh, in many ways and that's not a bad thing that's just Crypto is too too big of an idea for it to stay all as one thing. Um, so I think you're gonna we're gonna see that happen. And I think as we see that happen, uh, if you're if for anybody listening or watching, if you're interested in the money side, you probably want to follow the, that storyline, right? Like you want to follow the Bitcoin and the trading desks and the ETFs of the world. Like you want to go that way. If you're interested in blockchain being implemented in the businesses and uh, making the world differently, you know, kind of tokenizing the whole world, you should follow that train. But eventually it, it, it's it's very difficult to try to intermix these two, uh, especially kind of a, as, a, as an investor or as a trader, so to speak. But I'm very, very bullish on the whole idea of all of it because um, kind of like what we were talking about earlier, the world is not headed in a place where like, oh, well, we'll just create, like there's more companies or there's more assets we can have, or there's, there's more wealth out there. There's more value. Like that value needs to be manufactured somewhere. And cryptocurrencies, blockchains, distributed ledgers, all of it provides the ability to create all of that stuff. And that is a very, very, very big need that people who have, who are market makers, right? A lot of banks and people on the front side of this, they know that that's the, the next, that's what they need to be doing. And that's why they're looking at this sort of technology. How that plays out for the average person in terms of, you know, getting a return on your investment or working on a project you're really interested in, we'll, we'll see, right? We just don't know with regulation and markets and how that all works out. But um, it's very, very exciting. I can tell you, San Francisco, I mean, it's still the, the engineering and the development is out of control. How much, how many people, how much horsepower is being put into this stuff? 
It's just uh, that split has not happened yet. It's still all still all in a in one big bucket, and that causes a lot of confusion, causes a lot of you know investor confusion and all that sort of thing. I think that what is what makes me so confident. It's just the smartest minds and people. We spoke to a recruiting agency yesterday. They're pulling people from Google and Facebook and that to come work on crypto projects, from the banks to work on Bitcoin and the, you know, the underlying infrastructure. So that's what makes me so bullish. So, thanks so much for joining us today, mate. I hope we speak again in the future. Yeah, thanks for having me. Cheers, guys.